الحمد للہ والصلاة والسلام على رسول اللہ وعلا علی وصحابی اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن احسن قول ممن دعای لاللہ وعمل صالحا وقال ان من المسلمین رب شلی صدری وصلی امری وحل العقدت من لسان یفکہ وکاولی I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, the Peace TV Chinese and the social media platforms that is the Alidaya, my Facebook and my YouTube channel, the Instagram and the Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessings. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. I welcome you to the program, Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 10, Session 5. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compassionate religion or questions that a non-Muslim may have posed and you are unable to reply or any question that you find on the media that is attacking Islam, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question the best is to ask on the Alida platform. The next is to ask as a text message on the WhatsApp. You can also ask on the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram. But the best is to ask as a text message on the WhatsApp mentioning your name, your profession, your city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat, plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero we'll take the first question from the whatsapp the first question <coughs> the first question is my name, my name is Humaid from the UAE. My question is, Allah says that lakum dinukum waliyadin, but when someone receives the message of Islam and does not accept it, he will become a kafir. He will enter hell and will stay there always. Do you think that it is contradictory or unjust? The brother has quoted a verse of the Quran from Surah Kafirun, chapter 109, verse number 6, where Allah says, Lakum deenukum waliyadin, to use your way and to meet mine. To use your religion, to use your deen, to meet my religion, to meet my deen. So based on this verse, if someone does not accept Islam and he stays as a kafir and if he goes to hell, isn't this unjust? Isn't this injustice? The reply to your question would be given if you quote the full surah of the Quran in context, you are just quoting one verse of the Quran that is the last verse, that's the reason you think it is contradicting. But if you read the full surah along with the translation and you know the Nuzul al Quran, there will be no doubt about it. The full surah is Surah Kafirun, chapter 109, verse number 1 to 6, where Allah says, Kul ya ayyuhal kafirun, la a'budu ma ta'abudun. ولا أنتم عبدنا معبد ولا أنا عبد ما عبدتم ولا أنتم عبدنا معبد لكم دينكم واليدين. which means that say to those who reject faith you you will not worship what I worship I will not worship what you want me to worship I will not worship that what you want me to worship I will not worship what you worship to you the your way to me is mine if you know the context of this when was the surah revealed, when the kafir, when the rejectors of Islam, the pagans, at that time, at the time of the Prophet, they said that, why don't we come to a compromise? You, when the message of Islam was given to them, when the message of Tawheed was given, when all the details of Islam was given to them, yet they rejected the faith. And they said that, why not you follow our deen one day, then we follow your deen, to the reply to this argument, the verse was revealed, say to those who reject faith, I will not worship that what you want me to worship. I, you will not worship what I worship. 
I will not be worshipping that you want me to worship. You will not worship what I worship. To your way, to you is your way, and to me is mine. That means if after the message of Islam has been given to you, that you have to believe in one God, that you believe in Tawheed, you have to believe in the last and final messenger, if you do not, you will be in khasara. This life is a test for the hereafter. If you do not follow the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the hereafter you will be among the losers. You will go to hellfire. After saying this, after giving the message of Islam, if they reject the faith, they are called a kafir. And then Allah says, after giving the message, if you don't believe, okay, to use your way to me is mine, to use your deen to me is my deen. Then when Allah has told them, and we Muslims have conveyed the message, to those who reject Islam, that if you reject Islam, you will be going to hellfire and they don't mind it. Then we say, you continue with your way of life, we'll continue with us. And then, if they are put in hell, then where is the injustice? It is very clearly mentioned in the context. And if you give, if you deliver the message of Islam to any non-Muslim, after delivering the complete message, if he doesn't agree, if he doesn't want to accept, you can't put a gun on his head, you can't force him to accept Islam, Quran clearly states in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 256, there is no compulsion religion. But the world doesn't end there. It says, truth stands out clear from error. If you hold the hand of the Satan, he will take you from light to darkness. If you hold the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will take you from darkness to light. The complete text, if you know the complete context, it's very clear. Similarly here, Yet if he doesn't understand, you can't force it. You say to yours, your way, to me is mine. That means if you do not believe that if you do not worship one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you do not obey in the commandments of Allah and his Rasul, you will be in khasara, you will be in loss, you will be in hellfire. And then if he is put into hell, where is the injustice? We have delivered the message. Only after delivering the message and conveying the message of Islam, can you say this last verse of Surah Kafirun? Lakum dinukum al yadin. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Safa Siraj. I am a senior in high school and will graduate soon. I live in New York City, the United States of America. In America, it is very easy to fall into major sins. The fitna here is very high and I cannot practice Islam as much as I want to. For example, interest is everywhere. I, if I want to open even a bank account, I will have to pay interest. There are many more major sins that are being propagated here. My question is, how can I make hijra to Malaysia alone as a young American woman? I plan to be a gynecologist, inshallah. Please give me some tips. Jazakallah khair. The sister Safa Siraj, she lives in America and she agrees that there the situation and the atmosphere is not very compatible to the teachings of Islam and there are many major sins that are difficult to stay away from the sins of riba, of fitna, of obscenity, etc. And she wants to migrate to Malaysia. She wants tips how to do it. Maybe she has heard my earlier answer that today in this age, according to me, the best of the worst or the best available country for a Muslim to live according to me it is Malaysia. I will not give the details which I have given in my earlier answers. But according to me, one of the best countries where a Muslim can live today, that can follow his deen and follow and be a good practicing Muslim, etc. And yet have a modern life, it is Malaysia. So basic question was that how can she, as a young, alone American woman, migrate and live in America? Since you said that you have just close to finishing your high school and you want to be a gynecologist and you're young, the best way I could say is that you should marry a Malaysian. Because to get the citizenship to get the citizenship of Malaysia is extremely difficult. Even to get the permanent residency 
the PR of Malaysia is extremely difficult. Unless if Allah will, then you have very good, good contacts. It's, that's a different situation. But generally, it is extremely difficult. Unlike many of the Western countries where you spend a few years, you can get uh, easily a uh, PR, you can get a citizenship. In Malaysia, even if you spend 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the chances are negligible. Coming back to your question. So the best option that I can think is that since you are of a marriageable age, my best suggestion would be that you marry a Malaysian who is a practicing true Muslim. <coughs> and I believe that an average Malaysian is a better practicing Muslim than an average non-Malaysian. I'm not talking about the Arabs. I'm not talking about the Gulf countries. They're on a different level. But talking about the Muslims from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or the other parts of the world, on an average, an average Malaysian Muslim is a better practicing Muslim than an average Muslim in India or an average Muslim from Pakistan or from Bangladesh. Because, alhamdulillah, the deen is inculcated in them right from the childhood. But of course, you have good apples and bad apples. Some of them are very bad, some of them are good. But on average, they are more practicing as compared to the Muslims from other parts of the world, not counting the Gulf country and the Arabs. The next solution is, if you cannot get a good spouse who is a Malaysian, the next option is that you can marry a good practicing Muslim who has a permanent residency of Malaysia. There are a few hundred thousand who have permanent residency of Malaysia. And if you can find a good practicing Muslim, then also it's quite good because if you marry a PR for you to stay here is very easy. Otherwise, immigration is the most difficult in Malaysia. To get a tourist visa is very easy, but to get a residency visa is very difficult. To get a citizenship is extremely difficult. To get a PR is very difficult. Even to get a work permit is difficult. There are various rules and regulations. So this option is better if you can marry a person who has a permanent residency then but naturally you directly get a spouse visa and the children that are born if you give birth to your children in Malaysia then they get citizenship if you marry a Malaysian also they get citizenship but if you marry a PR and if you give birth in Malaysia then all your children get Malaysian citizenship the third best option that I can think of is that since you want to become a gynecologist you can do your medical studies in Malaysia Malaysia has a very good education institutions, several, many, where they have for the undergraduates, they have for the graduates, they have for the postgraduates, they have for the PhD, there are plenty of them. So since you want to become a gynecologist, best would be to do your medical studies from Malaysia and getting a visa for a student is very easy and very cheap. So the next option that I can think of is that you should do your medical studies in Malaysia. The Fourth option can be that you can also marry a person who has a work permit, but this work permit is not for long since you want to settle in Malaysia. If you marry a Malaysian citizenship, if you marry a person who has a Malaysian citizenship, it is the best. Next option would be a person who has a permanent residency so that it's very easy. If you marry someone who has a work permit, then till his work visa is valid maybe for one year, for two years or three years, it's limited. He can renew it. But everything is not that easy in Malaysia and then you want to come here, you can find a job here. But getting a job here is difficult because there are umpteen number of doctors, both medical doctors and PhD doctors. Here you find many medical doctors and medical, many people who have passed PhD. There are so many umpteen number of universities. So every year there are hundreds of people who are passing and they are becoming PhD. So every time you find a person, very often that in front of his name is the name doctor, then you have to find whether he's a medical doctor or a PhD. So getting a job here would be difficult, but these are the options that I can think of. Getting a tourist visa is very easy. If you're coming from America and you'll be allowed for, I think, six months, depending upon the nationality. Some nationality allowed for one month, like from India, it is one month. If you come from some countries like 
like Yemen, etc., you're allowed for three months. If you come from countries like UK or USA, if you have a nationality and you are a UK citizen or American citizen, you can come here for six months, but you cannot stay for longer than six months. You have to go out and come back and it will be difficult for you to settle here. So these are the best five options that I could think of if you want to settle here in Malaysia. Hope that answers the question. One more thing I forgot. That the sixth option can be is that you can apply for MM2H, Malaysia, my second home. And MM2H earlier was very easy, now it has become difficult. Previously, the rules and regulation for MM2H was that you have to invest 300,000 ringgit. That is maybe somewhere close to about $75,000 or less than that. And you put in the bank, after one year you can remove half the money. And you have to prove that you are earning 10,000 ringgit. Again, that's about $2,250 $2, a month. And you can apply and within two or three months you have to get the MM2H. MM2H means Malaysia, my second home. And you, you get a 10 years visa. You can do everything except work. You can settle with the family. It's mainly meant for people retired or want to make Malaysia the second home. This, is the, this was the easiest way to get the long-term visa in Malaysia. It is very economical. You just invest the money. You can put in an Islamic bank. And after one year, remove half the amount. And the remaining half stays for nine months. Recently, last year, they have changed the rule. And they've increased the amount of the MM2H, Malaysia my second home. And they call it the v, VIP visa. Now you have to invest 1 million ringgit, which is about 225,000 US dollars. And after one year, you can remove half. And the balance has to stay. It is for five years. Again, renewable for five years. It has become more difficult. But the advantage here is with this new money, or if you are married, you put your children in the government in Sabah, Sarawak, then too, you need 15 days there. And the balance part of there, you can stay any part of Malaysia. So this was a very good option earlier. Now it has become a little bit expensive, the MM2H visa. But yet, if you have the funds, you can utilize this, this last option, which is for a long term. You get initially used to get for 10 years renewable, 10 years now it is 5 years renewable every 5 years. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Rizwan Ahmad. I am 18 plus. I am from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Currently studying A levels. I used to have true belief in Allah until I saw some random atheist videos. It created a lot of questions in my mind about Allah that whether he is listening to me or not. The scientific things which are written in the Quran, whether it is written by Allah or someone very knowledgeable wrote it. I am suffering from this, I am suffering from these types of questions in my mind and I would like to request you to reply to my message so that I can get a relief from this problem. The question posed by Rizwan Ahmed from Dhaka, Bangladesh is a common phenomenon. Because nowadays you find on the internet, the whole world has become a global village. And you find on the social media, there are various platforms in which there are missionaries working and they are attacking Muslims. There are Christian missionaries, there are other missionaries, there are atheists who try and attack Islam and take out force in the Quran, ask questions which confuse a Muslim. And there are many Muslims who get confused and from them, many of them even leave the deen. Though compared to the 2 billion Muslims, the numbers are very small, but even if few go, it is a disaster. So what is the solution? These people, these atheists and those who attack Islam, who are critics of Islam, they pose such questions which it is difficult for a normal Muslim or even for a pious Muslim to reply because these are specialized question and should be answered only by those who are specialized in answering to the non-Muslims. So that is the reason that we are having these, these sessions. Ask Dr. Zakir, ask Sheikh Farik, so that 
you can get the replies to this question. It's difficult for us to go to each of these websites. If we go, we'll be catering to a few hundred. But here, when we're having these live sessions, every week, initially when we started, there were more than a million. But now there are a few hundred thousand every week watching this program. And after that, it's yet available on the platforms like YouTube, like uh, Facebook, like Alidaya, and millions are benefiting. So the reason we have this session is so that you can ask these questions. And what you said, that there are questions that being doubt, that does Allah know us? You know, a question like was asked to me during last session, that if Allah knows everything, why do you have to do dua to Allah? If God knows what you want, why do you have to do dua to Allah? The question. And it's a logical question. And this answer was given by me in the last session. That what is the reason Allah wants us to do dua to him? Even though he knows what you want, then there may be questions like, who created Allah? This is the old question which I have replied, but again I have replied in detail. So how to reply to these questions which trap a Muslim? And regarding your other question, that yes, there are scientific points in the Islam, there are many scientific points in the Quran, but most of them, they were known earlier. And that was the question that was asked to me two sessions before, which said that Quran says that the light of the moon was its own light. The light of the moon is its own light. But this was discovered by a Greek philosopher a few centuries ago before the Quran was revealed. And the argument is correct. But I give the reply, what they failed to realize that out of the thousands of things that are mentioned in the Quran, there are a few things which were discovered earlier. But the same Greek philosophers who said that the light of the moon was its own light, they also believed in the theory of geocentrism that earth is the center of the universe, which is totally wrong. They also believed that the earth circled around the sun, which is totally wrong. So imagine someone picking up various things and only selecting that which is right and not copying that which is wrong. It cannot be possible. And I explained in the theory of probability. So these questions when are posed and when you try and find on the Google, yes, there was a Greek philosopher said that. That means that the Quran is nothing unique. But then I gave the reply, this theory of probability. That the chances of it being right is how much. And I gave the reply which you can listen to my answer which I gave two sessions earlier. So these questions that attack Islam have to be replied by someone who specialized in replying to the atheist. Someone who specialized in replying logically to the non-Muslims. So that is the reason we have these sessions ask Dr. Sakir, in which 30% of these questions we pick up are mainly dealing with these non-Muslims who attack Islam and take out force in the Islam to deviate the Muslims and how to reply. 30% may be logical questions asked by Muslims who may not know the reply and we reply to that. 30% may be questions on fiqh and maybe 10% may be on pure comparative religion, quoting the Quran, the Vedas, etc. So these question answer session basically answers to most of these questions. So the two questions that you pose are already replied. What I would suggest to you, brother, is that you hear and watch all my sessions. You know, this is going on for more than two years. There are 10 seasons and this is the fifth session. Each season I have on average approximately six sessions. Sometimes it has nine. So totally already more than 60 plus Ramadan would be 70 sessions have been taking place. Any session I reply about 15, sometimes 20. So more than a thousand questions have been answered. And very few are repetition, less than 5%. So if you watch the answers to these thousand questions, inshallah, if not all, almost all your queries would be answered. So I do request you to watch all my answers of this session ask Dr. Zakir and inshallah almost all your queries would be answered. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> we have on the Facebook Sultan Ahmad Beg, love from Pakistan. Hosin Vigri, love you, Zakir Naik, I love you too. Shahid Mateen, 
ام رحیم ماشاء اللہ ابا تورو اسراف الحسن اومی امین الاسلام بلبل فرام بنگلہ دیش حارث ایوب کھٹک سمیر باب پٹھان ارشو and most of them are doing duas for me i do duas for you also now wishing assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh on the youtube we have abdullah al numan alia sultana zain arif assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam saddam daniel jb al mahmud راج زین عارف مخل فیک رفیق احمد جید محمد مون ڈریم سجال بہرا سویل عالم خان Samia Reza Rakshinda Khan Muhammad Siddiq Sna Chisti Sujal Bohara Most of them are doing duas for me May I also pray that inshallah may Allah give you janita fridos All the Muslims that have done duas for me Many are saying salam Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh There's a question from YouTube. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Respected Zakir Bhai. I, Rintu Sheikh from Kolkata, India. I am a fact finder. Recently, Indian judiciary system acquitted your student, Arshi Qureshi. Please say something regarding it. Yes, Alhamdulillah. It was good news that I received today early morning that Arshi Qureshi, who was the public relation manager of the Islamic Research Foundation, he was framed by the Indian government, by the Indian police, that he was radicalizing some non-Muslims and making them Muslims and radicalizing them to go out for war. All this was the allegation and he was arrested in 2016, about six years back just a few months before Islamic Research Foundation was was banned and they arrested him and Alhamdulillah by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala though it was a long battle after six years the judiciary they acquitted him and they said that there was no evidence found that he was radicalizing anyone and all these allegations are false after six long years Alhamdulillah he was acquitted, though it was late, but better late than never. And as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلِ قَانَ الزَّوْكَ When truth is hurled in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give to brother Arshi Qureshi sabr. And I know that, mashallah, he was a very good practicing Muslim. And... I know him because he worked and yes he has been my student also <clears throat> he attended the Dawah training program and he was very effective as far as convincing a non-Muslim to accept Islam amongst all my staff we had 500 staff he was the most effective the maximum number of people that he made to come to Islam as compared to any of the other staff we had, mashallah, many shiuks from Medina, graduates, masters, PhD. He, mashallah, was a practicing Muslim who went to America and he came back from America because he didn't like and he came back and he joined the Islamic Research Foundation. 
and mashallah he was very effective and he had the passion of doing dawah and he could not see anyone you know, doing things which are wrong he even went after those muslims who were doing bidah he used to get them on the straight path and it's it was really great to hear that he has been acquitted you know there are muslims who have been behind bars for false charges for years some for 10 years some for 20 years and after 20 years they say that the person is innocent imagine his full life is ruined but what i heard that arshi qureshi even when he was behind bars in prison he conveyed the message to many non-muslims and many of the prisoners who were non-muslims mashallah the big muslims may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the best in this world and the akhirah i know that six years are very long and for six years when he was behind bars his family may have faced a lot of problems i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he grant the best to arshi qureshi in this world and the akhirah and i'm sure he'll be rewarded these are tests from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the test is that when a dai when he propagates islam and is accused and put behind bars you have examples of several such scholars ahmed ibn hanbal imam ibn taymiyyah uh, and many of them and how they faced so even going to the jail is one of the sunnas you know that you know the sahabas were tortured they were imprisoned etc so and i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this six years i'm sure may have made arshi a stronger muslim and a better dai and it's a slap on the face of the indian government and yet we have faith in the judiciary though we know that after the new government has come and bjp has come to power since 2014 the judiciary is deteriorating but yet there are some good judges yet there mashallah and this is an example that they acquitted him without and they acquitted him of all the charges so yet there is some light there is some ray of hope though we know that the judiciary is not the same as before and that's the reason people ask me that zakir why don't you go back to india and face the charges going back is no problem it will be foolish for me to go back when i know that the government is unjust even if they are not able to prove that i have done wrong or broken the law it may take 5 years 10 years 20 years and imagine all my work would be spoiled so this is the hikma what we learned from the lifestyle of the seerah of the prophet what did the prophet do when he knew people were going to take his life or going to attack him he did hijra so i did the sunnah of the prophet and did hijra from india to malaysia and malaysia one of the best countries as i said in my earlier answer one of the best countries to live in i did hijra to malaysia there were more than 15 countries that were calling me i did a survey and i chose to live in malaysia going back is no problem but all my dawa would have been stopped maybe with a few people there and alhamdulillah after i did hijra my dawa increased my reach increased alhamdulillah by the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the help of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we take guidance from the seerah everyone it's not possible can do hijra it's with allah's help that i did hijra and and arshi qureshi he didn't have the time he could not do so allah put him to a test and i'm sure that arshi qureshi passed this test and i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give him the best of whatever rest of the life he has and inshallah inshallah in the akhira he will grant him jannat al firdaus inshallah i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him jannat al firdaus al ala and inshallah we hope to meet at shi qureshi in akhira in jannat al firdaus amen There's a question by Zain Arif. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Dar barakatuh. Dr. Zakir, I have two questions. Firstly, should I be a Sunni or a Shia? My second question is, should I read the Quran in English, which I understand better, or should I read it in Arabic? I'm a new Muslim. The person who asked the question is a new Muslim. He's a revert, and he asked, should I be a Sunni or a Shia? If you read the Quran, there is no Sunni or Shia. There's only a Muslim. Allah says, 
Kala inna ni mila muslimin. The ayah I quoted in the beginning of the session from Surah Fusila chapter number 40 and verse number 33. And then in the ending it says, Kala inna ni mila muslimin. Say that I'm Muslim. So there's no Shia Sunni in Islam. These have been made by the people. You as a practicing Muslim, you should follow Quran and say Hadith. So the right thing is you should be a Muslim. I know because of all the various sects that have emerged in Islam, there should be no sects. What you should follow is Quran and the Say Hadith. And anyone who follows the Quran and Say Hadith is a practicing Muslim. And anyone who follows Allah and His Rasul and follows the teachings of the Sahaba, they are on the straight path. All those who do not agree with the Sahabas and the teachings and the Khulfa Rashidin, they are on the wrong track. The Prophet clearly mentioned that you have to follow me and the teachings of the Khulfa Rashidin. You have to follow me and the Sahabas. So all those who claim to be Muslims and they don't follow the Khulfa Rashidin, the four Khulfa Rashidin, that is Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Osman, Hazrat Ali, all of them, Khulfa Rashidin, and the Sahabas, they are on the wrong track. You have to follow Allah, His Rasul, and, and the last time five messengers said you have to follow the Khulfa Rashidin and the Sahabas. Coming to your second question, that since you are a revert, is it better to read the Quran with English translation or in Arabic? Since you understand English but don't understand Arabic. The best would be is to read in Arabic and in the language you understand the best. If you read in Arabic, but naturally you get the sawab. If you know Arabic as a language, it's the best. Besides getting sawab, you can know the message and implement on the message. If you don't know Arabic as a language, then read the Arabic portion as well as read the English translation of the Quran if you know English as your best language. You should read the translation of the Quran in the language you understand best because the Quran was revealed to be implemented. The Quran is the most positive book in the world. It's a proclamation to humanity. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering. It's a hope to those in despair. It's a fountain of worth. It's a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless. And all this you can only get if you understand the meaning. So if you don't know Arabic as a language, the best would be to read the translation in the language you understand the best. Hope that answers the question. The question posed by Samia Riza. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. I am very much tensed about my future and marriage. As my aunt is still unmarried, so I feel very much tension about my marriage. What can I do for this? As far as the question for marriage is concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that you have to look for four qualities in the spouse. Normally people look for four qualities in a spouse. One is wealth, the other is beauty, the third is nobility and the last is virtue. And the best among this is virtue. So if you select your life partner as a virtuous life partner, that is the best. So my suggestion for you would be that you search for a virtuous life partner. I know finding a virtuous Muslim boy in this age is difficult, but you search and the best available, you marry. Don't, if you want all four, it's not haram, but to have a person who's handsome and a person who's wealthy, a person who's noble and a person who's virtuous is extremely difficult. To get a virtuous person is difficult. So my request to you would be, you should compromise whether he's handsome or not, whether he's rich or not, whether he's coming from a noble family or not. Concentrate only on virtue that he should be a good practicing Muslim. And when you mention Sahih Bukhari, oh young people who have had the means to get married should get married. The more you delay, so the available options would become less and it would be more difficult for you to find a virtuous person. If you are young, your options would be more, your choice would be better. So that's the reason, put a target, okay, I'll search for maximum six months or one year or whatever it is, make a target, then in that period, whatever best you find, 
the most virtuous amongst the one you have found, you should go ahead with it. Hope that answers the question. The air condition is not working properly. Can you just adjust it? It's too hot. Abdus Samad, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam. I am tired with life. I do namaz, that is salah. Also, I can't find my purpose of life. My advice to Abdus Salam would be that since you cannot find your purpose of life, I would request you to see my talk on what is the purpose of life. Inshallah, when you hear my talk, it's available on the YouTube, available on the Facebook. Inshallah, Inshallah, this would really open your vision and inshallah it would put you back onto track. You can also go to Alida platform and Alida platform also has a course what is the purpose of life. If you go to Dr. Zakir Naik's session, there are two uh, sections. One is Dr. Zakir Naik and one is other speakers. If you go to the section of Dr. Zakir Naik, there is a course what is the purpose of life. If you attend the course, this has got even a study guide, it has got the script, it has got a questionnaire, it has assessment. Inshallah, this would be beneficial for you. This is another question from YouTube, and I believe all these questions are from YouTube. It's a live question. Asked by Ahmad, is Allah fair to everyone? If life is like an examination for afterlife, then why he created unhealthy people? Shouldn't he be fair to everyone as he's taking exams? Question posed by Ahmad is that if this life is a test for the hereafter, then why did he create some people unhealthy while the other are healthy? Isn't it unjust? Isn't it? Uh, unjust for the people who are unhealthy. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mul chapter number 6 and verse number 2 that Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life that we are leading in this world is a test for the hereafter. He is testing which of us is good in deeds. Now the question poses that isn't it unjust that some people are healthy and some people are unhealthy. Whenever an examination is given the question paper keeps on changing. It's not the same. If the question paper is the same, then where is the test? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests some people with health, some people with wealth. Some people he makes healthy, some people he makes unhealthy. Some people are born with congenital defects. Allah wants to test that let me see if I make this person unhealthy, does he, does he yet worship me? If I make the person healthy, does he is he grateful to me or not? Allah tests some people with wealth. Some people, he makes them rich. Some people, he makes them poor. He's testing that those people, he makes them rich. Are they giving zakat? Are they giving charity? Those he's making poor, those who he has made poor, do they yet have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do they yet worship him? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests some people with wealth, some people with poverty, some people with health, some people with disease. Some people, he makes them intelligent. Some people, he makes less intelligent. So different people, he tests in different way. And depending upon the ability and the facility Allah has given you, he gives you marks depending on that. For example, a person who is rich, he has to pay zakat. But the person who is poor, he has to pay no zakat. He gets 100 out of 100 in zakat. But a person who is rich, most of them did not pay zakat. They will get less marks. Or some may pay part zakat, they'll get half the monks. So depending upon 
the facility Allah has given you, because the test for a rich man is difficult, for most of the rich people, they may deviate, they may not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they may not give charity, they may not give zakat, the poor man, he gets full marks, he remembers Allah more, so you never know, Allah tests different people in different way, and depending upon the test he has given, he gives marks. If you are weak in certain things, Allah gives you handicap, he gives you bonus. So to say that because some people are unhealthy is injustice because you don't have the knowledge of the way Allah tests. That is the reason you're saying that. Hope that answers the question. Question posed on the YouTube by Taha Akhtar. Sir, I am a converted Muslim and my brother and my wife died. His children are young and of course my brother was a non-Muslim as well as children. Should I convert them to Islam at this age? Brother Taha is a convert, he is a revert. And his brother yet was a non-Muslim. He and his wife died and the children are very young. So should he convert them to Islam? And but natural, when you are taking care of the children, you have to give them the right tarbiyah. The moment you teach them about Islam, about Salah, etc., they're young, they will follow you. Automatically they become Muslims. If you ask them, should you convert them? Yes. You should convert because that is the best for them in this world and the Akhirah. Because you are the guardian. You have to give them the right tarbiyah just because your brother was a Hindu and you know that Islam is the right way of life, it's the right religion, it's the right deen. So but natural you have to give them the Islamic knowledge, the Islamic upbringing and make them good practicing Muslims. There's a question on the YouTube from Tripology. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. My name is Muhammad Asher. My question is what to do when Satan is putting bad thoughts in mind and how to prevent it? When Satan whispers and does waswasa, as the Quran says, you have to say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Say, I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the cursed. So when you have these whispers of the Satan, you have to say Auz Billah Shaitan Rajim that you seek refuge, say I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the cursed. And it is better that you recite certain surahs, you can recite the last two kuls which are the Mu'azatain, Surah Falak and Surah Naz, you can recite the Quran. And when this thought comes, you seek refuge in Allah and go away from this thought. Don't ponder over them. If you ponder, then the chances you'll deviate. So when this thought comes, just say, Auzubin Ashadayin Rajim, and you can read the Quran, or you can pray, you can offer Salah, whether it be the Fard or the Sunnah Salah, this will help you to take your mind off There's a question from the YouTube by Wajahat Rafiq. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum wa alaikum assalam, wa alaikum wa alaikum Dr. Zakir, I am from Kashmir. I have so many atheist friends around and I wish to illuminate them with the light of religion. Please guide me the way to convince them. The best reply to your question would be that you watch my video cassette, Is the Quran God's Word? And there, I have proved logically and scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and logically and scientifically that the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So if you hear this lecture of mine, is the Quran God's word, 
<coughs> or Quran and modern science, surely it will help you to convince the atheist. And the session that we have asked Dr. Sakir, here there are many questions which are asked by atheists and the replies that I give, inshallah, they'll be very helpful in convincing your atheist friends to accept Islam. Hope that answers the question. The next question we'll take from WhatsApp. <clears throat> My name is Nusra. <clears throat> My name is Nusrat. I am a university teacher in USA. I teach economics cost analysis course which involves calculations with interest. Am I allowed to teach such a course? Sister Nusrat is a teacher in USA and she teaches economics in which there is a course of cost analysis in which she has to teach about interest. So is it allowed for, to her, is it allowed for her to teach about interest? Teaching about interest per se is no problem as long as you do not promote it. While teaching economics, a course on cost analysis, when you talk about how to calculate the interest, at the same time if you say that interest is haram and talk about the negative points about interest, you can hear my talk on interest fee economy. There I have proved the ill effects of interest, etc. So what we do is that if you are a teacher and if there is a subject on interest, while teaching about how to calculate interest, if you make it a point mentioning this haram that it is a major sin in Islam and there are no less than eight places where Allah mentions about interest, about riba and say it's haram and Allah says in Surah Bakra chapter number 2 verse number 279 and 2 verse number 278 and 279 that if you give up not your demands of riba, Allah and his soul will wage a war against you. So if you say all these things that haram and the ill effects of interest, no problem. And you can promote Islamic banking that you can go to an Islamic bank and if you take a loan on the Sharia principles, on Musharika, or Murhaba, or Qas Plus, then it's perfect. So while teaching, you promote the Islamic economics, promote the Sharia way of how to give finance, then there's no problem at all. Next question from WhatsApp. <clears throat> My name is Zulkarnin Sabir. I live in Azad, Kashmir, Pakistan. I am a student and I am a Muslim. I have a question that we are all children of Adam. Peace be upon him. Then why are our languages different from each other? The question posed is that if you are all children of Adam, then why are the languages different? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hujura chapter number 49 verse number 13 Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaku min zakrin wa unsa wa jalnakum shi'umba wa qaba ila li ta'arafu inna kramu min the Allah yatkaku min the Allah aliman kabeer O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, the person who has God consciousness, who has piety, who has righteousness. So ya Allah says that the whole humankind have been created from one pair, Adam and Eve. Peace be upon them. And he has divided us into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. Regarding question, that if we all are children of Adam, then why are the languages different? Allah says in Surah Rum chapter number 30 verse number 22 that amongst his signs is that he has created the heavens and the earth and has made the variations in the languages and the color and these are signs for those who know so Allah says that amongst his ayat amongst his signs is the creation of the heavens and earth and amongst the signs is also that he has created the human beings to speak different languages and from different colors. 
This is a sign for those who understand. Now the question is that if we are all children of Adam, then how come we are speaking different languages? Allah says not only different languages, He has made them in different colors also. It's very simple. There are many people who migrate to USA from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh. Many of the parents don't know English. They go to America and they speak fluent English. So the father doesn't know English, the mother doesn't know English, but the child knows English. It's nothing unique. It's not necessary that the children should speak or the father should speak all the languages the children know. That's the normal case. But there are many cases in which the children may learn other languages which the parents don't know. Coming to, coming to the other example given in the Quran of colors, that Allah has created you different, to speak different languages and in different colors. And I've made you into nations and types so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. So that you know each other, not that you fight amongst each other. Now, we know that the parents, if they have many children, it's not necessary that the complexion, that the color of all the children are the same. Some may be dark, some may be medium, some may be fair, some may be wheatish. Most of the time they may be similar complexion, but you find many a times that one brother is dark, the other brother is fair, one sister is me wheatish, the other is dark, keeps on changing. And then their children, when they get married, then the grandchildren, if you see the color of the grandchildren, there will be more variation, then the great-grandchildren will have more variation, then the great-great-great-grandchildren will have more variation. Adam will have salam, that's down so many generations. How many years we don't know. Now you find the variety of colors that is there because Adam, peace be upon him, he lived centuries ago. Now when we find that down the ages, so many generations have passed, this is the niyam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way the DNA functions, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human beings. So he has created the human beings, the Quran says in Surah Hujura, chapter 14, verse number 13, and made them into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other or fight one another. And he has created the colors and the languages in different people. So it's not illogical that the parents can have can have children who speak different languages and different colors and Adam, peace be upon him, you are the great, 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 great grandfather so all the more reason the variation in color and the variation in languages would be much more as compared to few generations hope that answers the question the next question Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Sifali, a student of class 12, and I am from West Bengal, India. I have some belief in Islam, but I belong to Sanatan Dharma, Hindu. My question is that as per our religion, there are many gods like Sri Krishna, Sri Ram, and many are basically and the many gods basically in a religion known as avatar of God so are they really the avatars of God as mentioned in Bhagavad Gita Sri Krishna tells Arjun that he is supreme God so he so is he the supreme God Safali who is from West Bengal India she says she belongs to Sanatan Dharma that's a sect of Hinduism and she has some knowledge of Islam and she says that in Hinduism they believe in avatar, you know, many gods like Sri Krishna, Sri Ram and in Bhagavad Gita it says that God has got many avatar. So is it true that God has avatar and is Krishna the supreme God? This avatar is a Sanskrit word coming from the root word au and tra. Au means down, tra means pass over. So avatar means descending down. If you read the Oxford Dictionary, it says avatar means a deity or a supernatural being who has come down on the earth in human form. In short, it is Almighty God coming on the face of the earth in human form. If you read the Vedas, which are the highest of the scriptures, amongst all the Hindu scriptures, there is no mention of, of, of avatar anywhere. I take form 
I come in every age. In Islam, we do not believe that Almighty God takes form. We don't believe in the concept which the common Hindu has about Avatar. In Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses a man amongst men and communicates with them on a higher level so that the, his message is delivered to humankind. And such people are called as messengers or prophets of God. So in Islam, we believe in messengers and prophets of God. This common philosophy of Hindus is from the Bhagavad Gita, but nowhere it is mentioned in the Vedas. There are many scholars of Hinduism who say that avatar means a possessive, someone which God possesses and cannot be himself. It means God has sent a man. So this concept which the Hindu scholars say matches with the Vedas. So if you reconcile Veda, that avatar means Almighty God sending a messenger for the human beings which is the same as in Islam. So if the Hindus say that Sri Krishna is an avatar of God meaning a messenger of God, we have no problem. Sri Ram is a messenger of God, we have no problem. But if you say no, he is God himself, then there are many logical problems. We know from, from Rama and that you know Ram had a lot of problems. Someone abducts the wife of Sri Ram. How can someone abduct the wife of God? God has a wife. And then that God cannot get back his wife. So he takes help of another God to get back his wife. If you say these problems are there in a human being with a messenger, we have no problem. But logically, how can God not get back his wife? First of all, God having a wife itself is illogical. Then to say that God could not get his wife back, so he takes help of another God. All these are contradicting with the teachings of Vedas. And you belong to Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma believe in one God. It's clearly mentioned in, in the Chandogya Upanishad. It's mentioned in the Sita Sada Upanishad. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad. Uh, section number, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam Evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sita Sada Upanishad. Chapter number 6, verse number 9. That Almighty God has got no superior. He has no parents. He has got no lords. It's mentioned in Sutta Siddhartha Upanishad, chapter number 4, some 19. Nata Masti. Of that God, there is no image. It's mentioned in Yajurubai, chapter number 3, verse number 32. Nata Sipati Masti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima means an image, a portrait, a picture, a painting. So it's mentioned in Yajurve, chapter number 3, verse number 32. Nata Sipati Masti. Of that God, there is no picture, there is no sculpture, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is no statue. So if you compare with the Vedas, the highest scriptures in Hinduism, and Sanatartam believes in one God. Sanatartam doesn't believe that Almighty God has got idols or have got various gods. They believe in one God. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism is Ikkam Brahm Dishta Naste. Naina Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Ekhi hai, Dusra Nahi hai. Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi. There's only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So, if you read the Hindu scriptures, the highest level, the Vedas, and you being a follower of Sanatana Dharma, you realize that God is only one. And these avatars are messengers of Almighty God, which we have no objection, but they are not God because God is only one. And God has got no image. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Maryam and I am a student currently living in America. I know from a hadith and from your videos that it is better for women to pray at home rather than in the mosque. However, some scholars say that those hadith were for that time where it was rare for women to go out in public. They say that since nobody, since nowadays, women go shopping, go to parks, etc. Why should they not go to mosque? Please answer this question. It will help me a lot and I really want to go to the mosque. 
you rightly said that I did say in my lecture and my question answer session that the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, where the Prophet said it is better for the woman to pray in an inner chamber than to pray in the portico, that is the veranda. It is better for her to pray in the veranda than to pray in the mosque. It's a hadith. But at the same time, if you hear my full lecture on women's rights and the question and session, I also said <coughs> that the Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, word number one, hadith number 865, the Prophet said, when the female servants ask you permission to go to the mosque even at night, allow them. The Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, volume 1, hadith number 865, that when the female servants of Allah ask permission from the husbands to go to the mosque even at night to give them. There's another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 1, hadith number 899, where the Prophet said, do not prevent the female servants of Allah from going to the mosque. It's, there are several hadith in Bukhari, several hadith in Muslim. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 442, that the beloved Prophet said, do not prevent the female servants from, of Allah from going to the mosque. So to say that some scholars said that at the olden time, at the time of the Prophet, people did, women did not go out, therefore women were prevented, this is only fabrication. These people are not scholars. I don't know which scholars say that. They aren't scholars. They may be some layman or uneducated people. At the time of the Prophet, the woman went to the mosque. There are several hadith in which the woman asked questions to the Prophet in the mosque. There are several hadith. When they prayed, the men were in the front, the women were behind, and the children were in, children were in between. The various hadith. So no one said that women cannot go to the mosque. Yes, I'm aware that due to certain cultures and certain sects, like if you go to India, rarely you will find few mosques which allow women. So that is more of the cultural practice of ignorance that women aren't allowed to the mosque. Going to the mosque is perfectly fine for women. Yes, but the better is at home. Because for the men, for them to pray the five times compulsory congregation salah, it's further to pray in the mosque. According to Imam Abdhabi, if the men do not pray in the mosque or if they miss praying in the mosque in congregation without a valid reason, it is the 65th major sin. So for the women, it's not further. But if they want to pray, they most welcome. And since you desire to go to the mosque, of course, you should, you should go. No one can stop you. And I'm aware in certain countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, very few mosques have place for women. But in Malaysia where we live, Almost all the mosques have place for women. They have good facility. If you go to the Putra Mosque where I'm living in Putra Jaya or Zainul Abdin Mosque, they have very good facilities, wudu facilities, toilets, separate area for women to pray. But natural in a mosque, the men and women when they pray, they have different designated areas for praying. Islam does not believe in intermingling of sexes. Otherwise, you know, like how we have in other places of worship, whether it be churches and whether it be temples, people come more for bird watching than for praying to God. So in Islam, women and men are allowed in the mosque. They have equal but separate facility. And if this is done, if you want to go, surely you should go. No one should stop you. And in America also, I've traveled several times. Even there, most of the mosques have got facilities for women. And for you to go, if you want to go, if you find peace and tranquility, I advise you should go. And there's no problem at all. We have on the Facebook Jisan Alwi, Muhammad Siyam, Assalamu Alaikum, love from Bangladesh, Ziaul Haq Jewel, Mustafa Zir Rahman Munna, Riyadul Islam, Rocky Bhai, Wasim Akram. Aris Ayub Khatak, Hivadu Kahwa, Shahji, Khatija Al Momin. That's from the Facebook. We have on the YouTube Raj Muawid Ali Yusuf Randwa, Nadir Sadia Sadia Rashida. Talha, 
ilmi dava Samina Yasin Most of them are wishing me salam, wa alaikum salam, telling duas for me, I do dua to you also. I do dua for you too. This question from the Facebook from Mohsin Ahmed. Is it permissible for the head of an organization to sign the documents of his employee for loan from a bank which involves interest? As we discussed earlier that interest is haram. It is the twelfth major sin in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter verse number 278 to 79 that those who give up not the demands of riba take notice of all from Allah and his Rasul. If you do, if you involve in riba, Allah and the Rasul will wage war against you. The several hadith in which the Prophet said it is prohibited for a person to give interest, to take interest, or be a middleman, or be a witness. So if you are signing any documents, you are helping. And Allah clearly says in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter 5, verse number 2, that help each other in bir and taqwa, in righteousness and good deeds. But do not help one another in sin and rancor. So you cannot help one another in riba, which is a major sin in Islam. It is the twelfth major sin in Islam and our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that there are various levels of riba and the lowest level is equivalent to doing zina with your mother. So if the head of an organization signs any paper to facilitate him to get a loan from the bank which is riba based, it's totally haram. Leave aside head of the organization, even as a friend you go and help someone open an account in the bank or facilitate him in any way for any of the involvement of banking which are involving riba it is haram it's haram to give riba to take riba or be a witness or help anyone in facilitating to get a loan from an interest-based conventional bank hope that answers the question The next question, my name is Afik Farid and I'm a student. I live in Kedah state in Malaysia. I have a very important question. If this life was a test, then how about people that have been chosen by Allah to become prophets? They are masoom. They do not have any sins and it's easy for the prophet to enter Jannah. Is this not unjust? For humans like us, but the Adif Farid from Kedah, Malaysia asked the question that if this life is a test for the hereafter and Allah has chosen some people as messengers, as prophets of God and they are sinless and they don't do any sin, so isn't it injustice for, for human beings like us? These people are masum, they are sinless, we have to undergo test and turmoil and then we go to Jannah. What about these messengers? Brother, your knowledge of Islam is very weak. Our beloved Prophet said, the most difficult test would be undergone by the Ambiyas. The most difficult test that Allah will give to any of the human beings are the messengers of God, are the prophets of God. There is no normal human being who will get a test which is more difficult than the test given to the Ambiyas. And there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. 124,000 prophets sent on the face of the earth. So to say that these messengers will not undergo a test is totally wrong. Allah clearly says that do you think you will enter Jannah without being tested? So these messengers are who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses men amongst men. He knows that these people will pass the test. These people will pass the most difficult test. Well, Allah is in my gap. So when he knows that amongst the human beings, these few human beings would undergo, if they underwent a very difficult test, they will pass, they will not fail. 
So Allah having ilm gab and knowing that these human beings will not taste the most difficult, will not fail the most difficult test, chooses them as messengers. So for you to say they will not undergo test is totally wrong. Yes, they are masum. Masum means sinless. So because they have the capacity to pass the difficult test, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects them and makes them sinless. But to say that they did not undergo test is totally wrong. And amongst all the messengers, the best messenger was the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad And we know from his sira the amount of turmoil, the amount of trouble, the amount of headache, the amount of criticism, the amount of abuses that he got. We cannot even bear 1% of this. So for you to say it is unjust for the other, it's unjust for the other human being is totally illogical. In fact, these messengers, they are tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they undergo the most difficult test and Allah knows they'll pass. Therefore, he makes them messengers. And Allah clearly says in the Quran that no one will enter Jannah without being tested. And all of us, including the messengers, including the sahabas, including the normal human beings, if we pass the test, follow the guidelines given by Allah and his Rasul, inshallah we'll enter Jannah. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum, Zakir Sahab. Wa alaikum assalam wa My name is Tanzim Ahmed. Country India, city Bareilly, profession electronic engineering. My question is if the congregation of Fajr is taking place and a person comes late after the Salah has started, then in the Jama. Because some people perform first two raka sunnah, then join the Fajr Jama. Brother Tanzim Ahmed has asked the question that if the Fajr Salah has started and if you come late, should you join the Jama directly or pray the two raka sunnah first and then join the Jama? I know there are many Muslims, especially in the Indian subcontinent, etc., where if the Fajr Salah has started, they don't join the Salah, they pray to Raqqa Sunnah and then join. There's a hadith of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu which says that the two Raqqa Sunnah Salah before the Fajr is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. So based on this hadith, people don't want to miss the two Raqqa Sunnah before the Fajr Salah. Before the Fajr Salah. And there's a hadith which says that after the Fajr Salah, there is no other Salah and after, until, until the sun has risen and after the Asr Salah there is no Salah until the sun has set. So based on this because you cannot pray after Fajr and two Raka Sunnah is very important there are some people who don't join the Jama they pray two Raka Sunnah and then they join the Jama. The ruling in Islam is if the congregation has started and if you have not prayed that Salah of that congregation you have to join. You cannot pray Sunnah first you have to pray the Fajr first the Fard Salah first because the Fard is a compulsory Salah. The Sunnah is optional even though it may be rewarding. So you cannot delay the Fard to offer your Sunnah. And there's Hadith of the Prophet that once the Prophet when he finished his Fajr Salah, he saw one of the Sahabas he started reading to Raqqa. So he asked him and he told him that after the Fajr Salah, there is no Sunnah. So the Sahaba replied that I had come late. I missed my Sunnah. So I am praying the Sunnah I missed. And the Prophet was silent. When Prophet is silent, it means the Prophet gave approval. So if the Fajr Salah has started and if you come a bit late, what you should do is join the Fajr Salah. And after the Fajr Salah is over, you can pray the sunnah. Though normally praying sunnah after the fajr is not permitted, but if there is a valid reason that you missed it, you can pray. The hadith in Bukhari that the Prophet prayed two raka sunnah after even the asr salah. And when he was asked, he said that some people came during the zuhar salah and I could not pray my sunnah after the zuhar salah. So he prayed after the asr. Normally praying after asr is not advisable, you should not pray, but if there is a valid reason, you can pray. If you are doing tawaf, 
their salat to tawaf. So some people, if they're doing tawaf after asr, they do the tawaf but don't read the two rakah salat to tawaf. What they do? They wait for maghrib salat after maghrib salat they read. No. If there is a reason, then if you're doing tawaf after asr, there's no problem, there is no harj. You can pray the two rakah sunnah of salat to tawaf after asr, before sunset you can do because there's a valid reason. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. a student from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Can Muslims wear blazers since it is the culture of the Christians to wear blazers? Walid Wazni has asked the question Can Muslims wear blazers because it is the culture of the Christians to wear blazers? What is prohibited in Islam? is for any Muslim to wear a symbol of Christianity or wear something which is a sign of Christianity. For a Muslim, it's not permitted that he can wear a cross because a cross is a sign of Christianity. A Muslim cannot wear a vermil on a tikka, which is a sign of Hinduism. But nowhere does the Quran and Hadith say that you cannot follow culture. You cannot wear anything which is a sign of the non-believers, like a cross, like a tikka. Nowhere in the Bible is it mentioned that wearing blazers is a sign of Christianity. Yes, it is a Western culture. To say Christian culture is wrong, it's a Western culture. So as long as there is no prohibition in the Sharia from wearing a blazer, there is no problem. Wearing a suit is no problem. There is no text in the Quran or Hadith which says you cannot wear a suit. And since wearing a suit or wearing a blazer doesn't go against the Sharia, you can very well wear it. What you cannot wear? Follow a culture which is against the Sharia. For example, if you say it's a Western culture to wear shorts, you cannot wear shorts. Because it is against the Islamic Sharia to wear shorts, to showing your satar. You have to cover your satar. So you cannot, a gent cannot wear shorts, which is above the knees. It is not permitted. So following a culture which is against the Islamic Sharia is prohibited. But blazer, wearing a blazer, it's mubah, it's optional. So there's no harm at all. Surely, a Muslim can wear a blazer or a suit, etc. It's not prohibited and it's permitted. Alhamdulillah. The next question from the WhatsApp, Muhammad Adnan Azam from Bahawalpur, Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa Sir, what was the religion of the Arabs before Islam? Idols in Kaaba before Islam represented which religion? Is there any similarity between Hinduism and the religion of the Arabs before Islam? What, which is the oldest religion in the world? The question posed is, the, what was the religion of the Arabs during the, during the time of the Prophet? And there were idols in the Kaaba before the last and final messenger. So which religion did they follow? Is it similar to Hinduism? And, and is it which is the oldest religion in the world. Regarding the religion of the Arabs at the time of Prophet Muhammad and before, they were pagans, they were mushrikeen, they were idol worshippers. 
And at the time of the Prophet, there were about 360 idols that were there in the Kaaba. Were they similar to Hinduism? No, different. There may be certain rituals that were similar, but as a whole, they were different. They were Mushrikeen, they were not Hindus. They were idol worshippers. Because in Hinduism, there are 33 crow gods. There are 330 million gods. Here, only 360. So you cannot compete with Hinduism and with and with the pagan Arabs. Regarding the last question, that which is the oldest religion? The oldest religion in this world is Islam. Islam, many people have a misconception that Islam is a new religion which is 1400 years ago and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the founder of this religion. Islam is there since time memorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of the religion of Islam, but he is the last and final messenger of Islam and the first messenger it is Adam, peace be upon him. So when man first set foot on the earth, Islam was there. It's the first religion. It is the oldest religion. And the first messenger was Adam, peace be upon him. And the oldest religion is the religion of Islam. And the first messenger is Adam al Salam, and the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. The next question Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, wa barakatuh. Sir, I am Sajid Tabassum Faruqi from Gujrawala, Pakistan. I am working in a software house where we work on credit card. I have heard from many people that working for credit card is not allowed as they charge extra fee if you don't pay within the due date, which is interest, known as APR in banking term. Kindly guide me whether working for credit card is permissible or not. Kindly ask Zakir Bhai to answer this question because we are 600 to 700 people who are working to provide services for credit card. Question posed by Sajid Faruqi is that he is working for credit card to promote credit card of a bank and if you do not pay in due time, you have to pay interest, is it permissible to work for credit card? Working for any institution which deals in riba, which gives money on riba or loan, etc., it is prohibited. In credit card, what credit per se is not prohibited. So giving, taking something on credit is not prohibited, but giving back based on interest is prohibited. So in credit card, what happens is that they allow you to use the credit facility depending upon the amount permitted for you, and you are supposed to return it back within one or two months. If you don't do, then they start charging interest. And the interest is exorbitant. Every month, 2 to 3 percent. Normally, the interest is 3 percent, 4 percent annually. Here, monthly, they charge 2 to 3 percent. Annually, it becomes 24, 24 to 36 percent. And they really cheat you. So, can you work for a company which facilitates credit cards? No, it's haram. You cannot work if this credit card can company deals with riba, it's totally haram. Working for Islamic bank for Islamic credit card is perfectly fine. So my advice to you would be that see to it that you work in a bank which is an Islamic bank or or work for someone who is involved in Islamic finance. But promoting riba is totally haram. Credit card is also haram, it's not permitted, and I feel you and your friend should stop it. Hope that answers the question.
The next question from the WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Nai. Wa alaikum assalam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am a 19 year old girl from Bangalore, India. My father was a police officer and he expired when I was very young. My mom gets pension every month from the government after my father's death. Is taking pension haram? And also at the time of death, his gratuity money was divided into parts and since I was a minor, the court ordered that my money should be kept in a fixed deposit and only after 18 years I can take that money. Since now I have completed 18 years, I can take the money but that money has been increased 5x from what it was initially. Is that considered to be riba? The question posed is that the sister said that she's 19 years old and when a father expired all the pension was kept and the court ordered that it should be kept in an interest based bank and now that she become more than 18 years old she's got the money but it has increased five times. That means in the past 18 years the money has multiplied five times so is it permitted is it haram for her to take it or not. As I mentioned my earlier answer that riba is haram in Islam, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 217 and 276 that if you give up not the demands of riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you if you do not riba. Giving riba, taking riba, facilitating, being a witness, all are haram. So what should you do now? The money that your father taking pension is allowed, but that pension money was put into an interest based bank which is totally haram but the Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 279 you can take your principal amount back so sin charity because that is haram you cannot utilize it and you can use it for dawa povit etc but you cannot use it yourself because that money is haram hope that answers the question Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Hassan ibn Khalil. I live in Bangladesh and I am a student. If we are invited to a person's house and the person is a Hindu or maybe of any other religion, when the time for prayer arrives and some reason if I cannot go to the mosque to pray my salah, is it permissible for me and my family to read salah in that person's house? Thank you very much. Regarding if you are visiting a non-Muslim friend, he may be a Hindu or any other religion and if the time for Salah then you cannot go to the mosque, can you pray in the house of a non-Muslim? Basically you should understand that for a man, as far as the five for Salah are concerned, it is compulsory further for a man to offer his five times Salah in the mosque in congregation. If according to Imam al Dhabi that if you do not offer your regular congregation salah without a valid reason it is the 65th major sin so praying in the mosque is compulsory and there are various evidence it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari volume number one hadith number 657 that the prophet said that if the hypocrites would have come to know the reward for praying the isha and the Fajr Salah, they would have come to the mosque crawling on the knees. I feel like telling the Muazzin to give the Akama and ask someone to lead the Salah so that I can go and burn the houses of those Muslims who do not come to the mosque for the congregation Salah. From this Hadith we come to know that praying in the congregation Salah in the mosque is fard. This is another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, hadith number 2420, in, in which the Prophet said that when, when the Adhan was, was proclaimed, 
he felt like telling the muazzin to give the akama and asking someone to lead the salah and it was the compulsory congregation salah and he felt like going behind and burning the houses of those people who did not come for compulsory congregation salah those men who did not come to the mosque for the compulsory congregation salah so there are various hadith which proves that praying in the mosque is fard so number one you should always pray in the mosque but if there's a hypothetical situation where you go out and you have gone to visit someone who's far away and you cannot go to the mosque then what is it what how do you pray if you have gone to a non-muslim house whether it be a hindu or a christian etc is it permitted to pray in a non-muslim house first the first salah should be prayed in the mosque but if you have gone somewhere out which is far away from the mosque and you cannot in this situation you can pray in the house of a non-muslim as long as the place where you are praying the room we are praying it should be free from any idols or any pictures and you can take a clean cloth if you have a sajjada pocket sajjada very good if not take a clean cloth or ask for a clean towel or a clean bed sheet and you can put it on the floor and pray see to it that there are no idols you can easily identify where the Qibla is you can take out your mobile phone and there are many apps you identify where the Qibla is and play in the direction of the Qibla but see to it that where you are facing doesn't have any pictures or any idols and the room you are praying should not have idols or picture as long as the place you are praying is clean you can pray in a non-muslim house whether it be Hindu or a Christian if it's far away and you cannot go to the mosque hope that answers the question The next question from Shanti Nath Opade from Pune, India. Why is it said you severe your you why is it said you serve your sins of the last birth in this birth and you will serve the sins of this birth in the next birth? Nobody has seen the last birth or next birth. Why not reward the good right away and punish the bad also immediately? How easy it will become for everyone to identify good and evil and the results thereof. I see misery around and am made to believe that they are suffering the sins of the last birth. Not seen by anyone. And then there are those who are enjoying life, though they are living through wrong means, they will suffer in the next birth. Again, nobody will know whether they will suffer or not. Request you to answer. Thank you. Shantina Dupadya, who I believe is a Hindu, has posed this question that they're suffering in this world and you ask them why they're suffering is it? So they say because they have sinned in the previous birth. And if people who are bad and done illegal things and wrong things, yet they're enjoying life, the people say that they will get the punishment next birth. He said this is illogical. He doesn't agree that there's something like next birth or previous birth. And he believes that if a person does something wrong in this world, he should be punished immediately so that people will know and people will follow the good believing that if he did something wrong because he, he did something wrong in the previous birth he's being punished here or if he does something wrong he'll be punished in the next verse is illogical i do agree with you that if you read in hinduism there is nothing like reincarnation there's something like punar janam it's mentioned in the way that punar janam means next life we muslims also believe in next life but when the Hindu scholars, they could not identify what is the logical reason that some people are born handicapped, some people are born healthy, some people are born poor, some people are born rich. So they came up with this philosophy of samskara, the cycle of birth, death and birth. And they started saying, they gave a theory that the person is now suffering because God cannot be unjust. How can someone suffer without any reason? So they came up with the philosophy that in the previous birth he did some sin therefore he's suffering in this birth and if some people who are enjoying life and they're doing by wrong means and they are not being punished they'll be punished in the next life so this philosophy was brought up by certain scholars but it is not mentioned anywhere in the vedas the vedas speak about punar janam next life which we muslim believe in the year after but there's nothing concept of birth death birth death birth death 
this is only the samskara or cycle of birth and rebirth is propounded by Hindu scholars but nowhere to be found in the Vedas. So I do agree with you brother that this concept of birth, rebirth, birth, rebirth is illogical. It is not even actually a part of Hinduism and even Islam disagrees with it. Coming to a second part of the question that if someone does something wrong we should punish immediately. Why wait later on? It's illogical. It's like you telling me that when you go to a classroom and you are in that class for one year. So if the student is weak, before the examination fail him, of course he will object. You cannot say that if a person is not answering the question asked by the teacher, you fail him immediately. Yes, he, he may get less mark, but the final result is only after the examination. The examination will take place at the end of the year, then only will the result come out. You cannot say that give it, it, it's very evident that the student is not studious, fail him. Similarly, this life is a test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Alladhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of is good indeed. So this life is a test for the hereafter. And there is a period. An average human being lives for about 75 to 80 years. The lifespan of gents is about 76 years. The lifespan for women is a bit more, more than 80 years old. Some people may die early at the age of 10, 20, 40, some may live 90, 95 years old. On an average, a person lives for about 70, 25 years. If he does sin, sometimes he's punished here, sometimes they left here after. You cannot say, no, no, you shouldn't be punished here. Sometimes they're arrested by the police, he's put behind bars. Sometimes Allah gives him disease, gives him sickness. We have lost in his business, he's punished here. But it's not a requirement that he should be punished here. Like in the class, you cannot say he failed unless he gives the examination. So similarly, there is no concept of life after death. Sorry, there is no concept of rebirth cycle, but there is a concept of life after death. And this life is a test for the hereafter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test who believes in the message of Allah? If a person does something wrong and immediately gets punishment, and something does someone does good and immediately gets punishment, he immediately gets a reward, then where is the test? Allah wants to test whether you believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not, whether you believe in the signs or not. So that is the reason some some of the punishments you get here, but the balance is in the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number one eighty five, that Every soul shall have a taste of that. But the final recompense will be in the hereafter. For anyone who has achieved the object of, of this life and has entered the paradise and has stayed away from the hellfire has achieved the objective of this world. That means it is said that every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final reward is in the akhirah, in the hereafter. Part reward you may get here in this world, part in the grave, but the final is in the akhirah. You may get punishment part in this world, part in the grave, but the final is in the akhirah. So that is the reason there has to be life after death. Imagine if you know Hitler, he is the person who has killed the maximum human beings. History tells us he has incinerated 6 million Jews. Now if you catch Hitler today, and you punish him, what punishment can you give? Maximum you can burn him. That will compensate only for one death. What about the balance 5,999,999 people he killed? So in this world, as you are saying, why don't you punish in this world? You cannot give a logical punishment. If you catch Hitler, what punishment can you give to compensate for the 6 million Jews that he killed? That's illogical. But in the year after, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 26, As to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them into the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they feel the pain. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to incinerate, wants to burn Hitler in hellfire, six million times he can do it. Allah wants to do, give, do it 12 million times he can do it. This verse of the Quran has a scientific evidence. When Allah says, He shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain, 
Today science tells us that there are pain receptors in the skin. And if a person has a burn injury, so doctor takes a pin and pricks it on the area of burn. If he feels pain, the doctor is happy that the pain receptors are intact. If he does not feel pain, the doctor is sad the pain receptors have been destroyed. So the Quran talks about the pain receptors and says that as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish Hitler six million times and burn him, he can do it in Akhira. In this world, you cannot. So therefore, you think that the punishment should be given here and the reward should be given here so everything would be black and white. It's illogical. Because certain punishments cannot be given here and the reward, for example, the best human being that we know in the world is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reward what Allah can give in the Jannah is multiple times more than in this world. So this world is a test. The final recompense is on the day of judgment. Hope that answers the question. The next question, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, I am Mukarram from Bihar, India. Many people are doing wrong things. For example, many people take bribe. And they tell that after some time they will do Tawbah. And Allah will forgive them since Allah is Rahman Rahim. Ghafur Rahim. How will I respond or clear out the misconception? But the Bukharam has said that some people involved in sins like bribing and they continue. They said that inshallah before we die, we will ask for forgiveness. Allah will forgive us because the Rahman Rahim is Ghafur Rahim, is most forgiving, most merciful. So how to convince them not to do this thing? When these people say that they do major sins like bribing, etc. And they say that they will ask for forgiveness and Allah will forgive them. There are five criteria to be fulfilled before Allah accepts your forgiveness. When you do Tawbah, there are five things left. Number one, you have to agree what you're doing is wrong. Number two, you have to stop it immediately, not after five years or ten years. Immediately. Number three, see to it, you don't do it again. Number four, repent and ask for forgiveness. Number five, if you can undo it. Because if you have taken bribe for someone, you have to return the bribe back. You have to undo it. If you have done a sin which you cannot undo, it's different. But the bribe of theft, you can undo it. You can give it back. So even those people who continue doing bribing, thinking that they'll ask for forgiveness, first of all, if they know bribing is wrong, they have to immediately stop it on the spot. Not after one year or two years. This will, <coughs> this will not be accepted. <coughs> and the last criteria is, that they have to undo it, they have to give it back if they have robbed, if they have bribed. So if they have collected bribing, collected all the bribery for several years, collected a lot of money, if they want to repent, they have to give it back. So what is the logic of taking bribe? And secondly, how will you know how long you want to live? You think, okay, I will do this major sin, or bribing or drinking alcohol for 10 years and then and ask for forgiveness. How do you know you are going to live for 10 years? Therefore, to give this argument that I continue with my major sin and then ask for forgiveness, Allah is Ghafur Rahim, is totally illogical. It is very dangerous and it doesn't fulfill the criteria. The best is when you come to know it is wrong, you stop it immediately. See to it, you ask for forgiveness. You don't do it again. And See to it that you can undo the wrong what you have done. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Mia Tahir Mahmood from Glasgow. 
यूके मुस्लिम आई वॉन्ट टू पब्लिश डॉक्टर जाकिर नाइक ऑन पैम्फलेट ब्रोशर मोबाइल एंड बिल बोर्ड ऑन माई मोन एक्सपेंस ऑन माई ओन एक्सपेंसिस सो दैट नॉन मुस्लिम वॉच यू मो हाउ कैन आई डू इट एंड कैन यू कैन यूर इंस्टीट्यूट अलाउ मी as far as all my materials are concerned whether it be booklets whether it be books whether it be pamphlets whether it be videos whether it be audios all my work is copyright free you only request that if you have copied it see to it that don't edit it don't tamper with it give us two samples so that we can keep it in our records but all my work whether videos whether lectures whether books whether cassettes all have got no copyright the more you copy the more sour will get so as far as copying and distributing is concerned there's no problem at all regarding question that how can you increase it in the social media whatever ability depending upon your speciality are you a specialist in social media do you have knowledge what is your you can always utilize it i don't know what's your following on the facebook or on the youtube if you have a large following of course you can share this video you can give whatsapp messages to your friends there is no harm at all and inshallah you'll be rewarded and allah will give you ajr in this world as well as akhirah due to shortage of time inshallah this will be the last question that i'll be answering assalam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh वालेकुम असलम वरक सईद अब्दुल हाफिज फ्रॉम अकरा घाना डॉक्टर प्लीज ड्यूरिंग सलाह एट द लास्ट रखा वेन यू आर डूइंग वेन यू आर डूइंग तशाहुद यू आर सपोज टू लुक एट योर फिंगर और वेर योर फॉरहेड इज टचिंग आर यू सपोज टू लुक एट योर फिंगर और वेर योर फॉरहेड इज टचिंग जजाक खैरन we thank allah subhanahu wa taala for giving you to us the whole world we look on to you jazakallahu khairan for your efforts in the deen where the sayyid from ghana is asking the question that in the tashahud in the last raka when you are saying your attayat and when you are pointing the finger should you look at the place where your forehead the sajda or should you look at the finger the general ruling is the scholars say that when you are offering salah you should look at the place where your forehead touches and when you are doing sujood also it goes to the same place so this is the place where you should look but during tashahud when you are sitting at that time it is preferable you look at your finger the hadith of the prophet it's a sahih hadith look at the finger so in tashahud is the only time you look in the finger you look at the finger all the other times you all the other times you look at the place where you do sujood this was the last question that we could answer and